Well, good morning, or maybe I should say good afternoon. I don't know when you're watching this, but uh, this was my lecture from Friday, April 21st, and we're going to cover the end of the 20th century. Basically, we're going to look at the presidencies of George H.W. Bush and uh, William Jefferson Clinton. So let's get started here. When we talk about George H.W. Bush, um, just a little background. He was born and raised in uh, Maine. World War II pilot, hero, highly decorated during his service. He served in the House of Representatives, uh, re representing the state of Maine. He was the ambassador to the United Nations under the presidency of Richard Nixon. Also served as the head, head of the CIA in 1976, almost for the full year. Um, ran against Reagan in the primary in 1980. He didn't win but Reagan will tap him to become his vice president, and he's going to serve as the vice president under Ronald Reagan for all eight years of his administration. Now, he ran for the presidency in 1988 after Ronald Reagan's second term, and the primary, I guess, slogan that came out of his campaign was, Read my lips, no new taxes. Quite honestly, this is going to come back to bite him on the butt very soon into his presidency. Um, he's going to run against Michael Dukakis. Michael Dukakis, uh, Dukakis was from Massachusetts. And running on their agendas, Reagan, or Bush was running on the Reagan agenda. He's not as conservative as Ronald Reagan was, but he is going to use the same policies and platforms that Reagan introduced. Just because, quite honestly, Reagan held so much success with those programs and held a very favorable uh, viewpoint from the American voter. So Bush is going to continue on that path, whereas Michael Dukakis is going to run with the idea of a bigger government, get more government involvement in, in American lives. Uh, we're going to see that Dukakis, one picture he takes during his campaign is when he basically dons um, some military garb and hops into a tank, and people kind of try to compare that to the service that George H.W. Bush had done during the uh, World War II and they, they look at basically what they consider a real war hero and a wannabe war hero. And that's going to hurt Dukakis later in the election. And you can see here that Bush wins easily in 1988 over Michael Dukakis to become our 41st president. A couple things that went on. Um, I got, actually I missed a slide, but actually um, 1989, the very first year that uh, Bush serves, is going to be a lot of events are going to take place. Here domestically, the United States is going to have to uh, deal with the Exxon Valdez oil spill up at the Prince William Sound in Alaska. This is going to result in 10.8 million gallons of oil that's going to be spilt in the Sound. The environmental impact probably is still being felt today. Uh, wildlife and plant life and sea life, everything affected by this. And it was quite, quite the environmental tragedy. The Soviets are going to leave Afghanistan. If you remember correctly, in an earlier lecture, I explained to you that the Soviets going to Afghanistan was their version of Vietnam. After 10 years, they finally leave. And I use this kind of as a bookmark for the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union. We're going to see events happening in places like Poland with their workers' strike and other Soviet bloc countries where they are going to start um, basically protesting and demanding their independence from the Soviet Union. So what we're going to see during this time period um, is, is the Soviet bloc basically coming apart, the Soviet Union ceasing to exist, and new independent countries coming out of Eastern Europe, primarily. Um, uh, terrorist attacks are going to become starting to get more uh, commonplace, if you will. One of the most uh, well-known ones is the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland. We saw 203 or 235 deaths, including eight deaths on the ground. Um, a bomb was planted, and basically the picture up at the top left there kind of shows the top of the plane blowing off, completely uh, disintegrated in air and, and came down in pieces over Lockerbie, Scotland. <laughs> the Tian Tiananmen Square massacre in China, 1989. Chinese students are going to protest for democracy. They're going to all come down to the town center in Beijing, uh, the capital of China, and 
China's not going to respond too favorably to this. We're going to see hundreds of people executed for their demonstrations. We're going to see thousands exiled or more, more common than not, imprisoned. And the U.S. response to this is kind of a, what I call a milk toast response. We're going to ban military sales to China and we're going to ban travel to China. And so uh, you're going to have a lot of people who are upset with the response or the lack of response to what goes on in Tiananmen Square. And of course, the big thing is the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, which we, we talked about in class. And we talked about how this kind of represents the end of the Cold War era as we know it. Uh, basically, it was a huge celebration throughout Europe, obviously a big celebration in Germany. Uh, to, within two years, the East and West Germany are going to, uh, to come back together just to form the country of Germany during this time period. Pop culture of the 80s, uh, Pac-Man came out. We thought the uh, pet rock in the 70s was cool. The Chia Pet was introduced in the 1980s. The original Nikes came out. And, of course, uh, the Valley Girl look was the fashion. If you want to see a good movie about that, watch Valley Girl. It's when you see Nick Cage. Probably think this is one of his first, first acting gigs. And, of course, we all fell in love with him during that movie. Uh, TV shows that came out. You can see the A-Team Dallas, Cheers, Cosby Show. We don't talk too much about Cosby today, but his show was the mainstay in, in the 1980s, watching the Huxtable family grow up. Movies that came out during the 80s, E.T., uh, Episodes 5 and 6 of the Star Wars series, Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. We see uh, the in Indiana Jones Empire come out, starting with Raiders of the Lost Ark, Ghostbusters. Music, Prince made his debut in the 1980s with Purple Rain. Michael Jackson and Thriller was huge, obviously. Madonna came out in the 1980s, Bruce Springsteen, Duran Duran. Yeah, I listened to all this stuff. This was my music. The big thing during H.W. Bush's presidency is going to be Operation Desert Storm. Basically, the crisis we had in the Middle East. One of the founding OPEC members, Iraq, led by Saddam Hussein, is going to invade another founding country's uh, territory of Kuwait and basically tried to control the oil in that area. Many believed uh, what was going to happen was uh, Hussein was going to take Kuwait and then start moving into Saudi Arabia and try to take care of the or take control of the entire region. The response to this is the United States through the United Nations formed a coalition basically setting up a deadline telling Hussein he must remove himself and his troops from Kuwait Otherwise, there will be a response from those coalition forces. Now, this is Saddam Hussein right here. He was a dictator or in Iraq. Some of the key players for the United States, obviously President Bush during this time. Um, we'll talk about the guy in the backseat here in just a minute. Colin Powell was one of the members of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He is going to later go on to become the Secretary of State under President Bush's son's presidency, uh, George W. Bush. And finally, the commander on the ground in Kuwait was General Norman Schwarzkopf. And these were the, the names that we heard over and over again during the Persian Gulf War. So we set the deadline for Hussein, and he did not meet it. So on January 16, 1991, the United States and the coalition forces launched Operation Desert Storm. Basically, the, the, the tactic that was used during Desert Storm, we went through six weeks of bombing the snot out of Iraq and the Kuwaiti for, and, and Kuwait, just basically softening up the target uh, to prepare for the ground war. When the ground war we began, basically it lasted four days. After 100 hours, President Bush declares victory, we get to Baghdad, and Iraq goes ahead and accepts the ceasefire and Kuwait is liberated. This picture here is the road to Iraq. It's showing everything that was abandoned along the way. Um, one thing that we did have to deal with, I don't have a picture of it, but as the Iraqis left Kuwait, they set all the oil drills on fire, and basically that's going to lead to a, another um, environmental hazard with the oil wells burning, but um, we did manage to liberate Kuwait. Bush is going to be given some... Uh, some grief because what he didn't do was remove Hussein from power. 
Some people are saying going to say that George W. Bush used that as motivation with the next war in Iraq. Uh, Bush Sr., his, his uh, I guess, defense of leaving Hussein in power was, that was not our mission. Our mission was to liberate Kuwait, and that's what we did. And then we pulled out of Iraq. Now, George H.W. Bush should have been able to ride the wave of victory to his re-election. However, what was going on here at home was we found we went into a major economic recession. We went, you know, the, the economy went high and boomed during Reagan's administration. Like I've talked about with economies, what goes up must come down. The United States enters into a recession. We start seeing businesses downsizing, people being laid off. And what Bush has to deal with is an all-Democrat Congress. And a lot of times having opposite parties in your executive and legislative branch is, can be a good thing because they balance each other out. Uh, in this case, what the Democrats of Congress, when they wanted to respond to the recession, they said we needed to raise government revenue. And the way you do that is raising taxes. Bush, rather than sticking to his guns of, and his promise of no new taxes, relented. A tax bill was passed, and of course he had to go to his voters and explain why he broke his promise. Uh, that's when I said his uh, comment, read my lips, no new taxes, is going to come back and bite him at this point. Also, he's dealing with some problems in the Middle East because we kept our troops in the Middle East because in order to maintain the victory, we have to keep a security force there. And we did have a lot of Muslims in the area who were angry that we stayed in the Middle East. This is going to lead to the election of 1992, when you see President George Bush and his Vice President George, or Dan Quayle face off with George, or Bill Clinton and Al Gore, his Vice President. But there was a third candidate in this election, and that is H. Ross Perot, a Texas billionaire, ran in the primary against Bush, did not win, and decided to run as an independent. Now, this is going to bear the same likeness to the election of 1912. So if you want some synthesis or have the opportunity, same in kind but different in time, you can compare the election of 1992 to the election of 1912. If you remember correctly in the election of 1912, you had William Howard Taft, the Republican candidate, going against Woodrow Wilson, the Democratic candidate. But, lo and behold, a third-party candidate came in, Teddy Roosevelt, in the Bull Moose Party. What happens in that election is Roosevelt and Taft split the Republican vote, giving the election to Woodrow Wilson. Well, jump ahead to 1992, and you have Perot and Bush splitting the Republican ticket once again, and the election goes to William, uh, uh, Bill Clinton. To close election... Um, Bill Clinton obviously has the majority in the Electoral College, so he is going to go on to become the president. One of the first actions he does as president is the NAFTA agreement between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And basically that's the North American Free Trade Agreement that removed all tariffs between our three countries. Basically what we wanted to do was create an international flow of trade. Basically what we did was we created a trade in balance between us and the other countries. Uh, and this is going to, honestly, we're still dealing with this today. And, and President Trump, one of his campaign promises when he came into office was he was going to end NAFTA. So that's a kind of to be continued story. The Brady Bill was passed under uh, President Clinton. Uh, James Brady was a victim uh, of the Ronald Reagan shooting by uh, Hinckley in the early 1980s. And he, can, he, he uh, uh, campaigned for new gun legislation, which Clinton used as a campaign promise. And when the Brady Bill was passed, what happened was now we require a waiting list and a background check when you want to buy a handgun. So this, this is a gun control legislation uh, referred to as the Brady Bill. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was passed during the Clinton administration. It is still illegal at this point in history to be in the military and be a homosexual. It was actually a question that they would ask you before they were allowed to, to join. So what Clinton did was he wasn't going to get legislation passed to legalize 
gays in the military. So what he did was he passed the don't ask, don't tell. We're not going to ask you if you're gay. You don't tell us if you're gay. And as long as that's the case, we're, we'll be fine. Now, a lot of activists said this is still a discriminatory policy against homosexuals. Others said this is a step in the right direction. So, you know, I'll let you decide on that one. 1994, you have the midterm elections, and what you have is Newt Gingrich, a congressman, leads a program called the Contract with America. And what he does is many of the Republican candidates for the House of Representatives sign this contract, promising that they're going to fight for a reduction in taxes, because remember, we're still living under the Bush tax increases from 1990. He's going to, they're going to push for a reduction in taxes, they're going to push for welfare reform, and they want to pass a balanced budget amendment. Still haven't gotten that passed yet. Well, the majority of the Americans agreed with this, and what we see is the Republicans take control of the House of Representatives. This is the first time that the Republicans have the majority in the House since 1954, and that's during the... Um, the Eisenhower year. So we're talking 40 years that the Democrats had control of the House. Now Republicans have control of the House. So we've kind of switched back to that idea of a different party leading the executive and the um, legislative branch. So it's going to be interesting. Can't talk about Clinton without talking about his scandal. A lot of scandals during Clinton's presidency. Obviously, we know about the, uh, the sexual harassment uh, claims that were made against him, the improprieties with uh, different women, and then there was the illegal land deal known as the Whitewater Scandal. Whitewater was um, a situation in which land was sold or bought, and a, a lot of people involved in this believed it was uh, obtained illegally, sold illegally. And many people were called to testify against the Clintons. Many people refused to testify against the Clintons and ended up in jail. During this scandal is when they un uncovered a lot of the sexual harassment and sexual uh, affairs that Clinton had throughout his uh, tenure, not only as president, but also the governor of Arkansas. Of course, the most well-known one is the Monica Lewinsky scandal. She was an intern in the White House, uh, a young girl, I believe 22 or 24, who had an affair with the president. What happened was, when Clinton testified about the entire situation, he lied. Lied about the affair, and because of that, he is guilty of perjury, because he was, he was imposed in front of a federal grand jury. The House of Representatives is basically going to bring him up on perjury charges, as well as obstruction of justice, and they will impeach him. When it goes to the Senate uh, for the vote or for the trial, the Senate votes and 55 to 45, he is found guilty of perjury and it was a tie in the obstruction of justice charges. However, without the two-thirds majority, he is not going to be basically indicted or convicted of these crimes. A two-thirds majority would require, what, a 60, or, yeah, 65? People vote, something like that. I'm doing math early in the morning, so forgive me. But anyway, they didn't reach the two-thirds majority. Uh, Clinton did go on record, spoke to the United States people, to the public, and did apologize for his actions. But his career is scandalized at this point. This is the scarlet letter on his political career. But that's not all that happened in America during the 1990s. It's what overshadows America, but it's not all that happened. We had the Branch Davidian tra tragedy that occurred in Waco, Texas, led by David Koresh, a cult set up a home front in Waco. What we had was there was um, charges of sexual abuse of, of young girls. We knew that he was stockpiling a lot of weapons during this time. So the ATF, both the ATF and the FBI got involved. We ended in 1993 with a 51-day standoff at the compound. It's going to end when a fire is going to break out and burns the compound to the ground. Some people believe that the federal government started it. Many believe that David Koresh started it himself. Regardless, April 19th, the entire compound burnt to the ground. 
76 people, including 20 children, are going to be killed at this fire. Americans are upset when they see this because, once again, we're watching this unfold on live TV. One person that was very upset was Timothy McVeigh. Timothy McVeigh was a Gulf War veteran and upset with how the federal government handled the Waco tragedy. He decided he was going to punish the government and he basically loaded a U-Haul truck down with a lot of explosives that he pulled in front of the federal building in Oklahoma City. He set off the bomb and you can see the damage to the building in that picture there. Um, he actually looked at several sites. He did look at the federal building here in San Antonio as well. So um, this was a well-planned out, thought-out plan. He ended up, obviously, was captured, was convicted, and put to death for, for bombing. This is one of our first examples of domestic terrorism in our country. Rodney King was a big issue during this time period. Rodney King was pulled over for speeding in, in, Los, in Los Angeles. He refused to comply with the, uh, the police, pulled out of his car, and someone captured the police beating Rodney, Rodney King, uh, which, of course, the video was, was released. The police were put on trial. They were acquitted of all charges. This is going to lead to the L.A. riots when millions of dollars of damage was done with you know, damage to homes, to businesses, and other places throughout L.A. Another big uh, event in the L.A. area is going to be the O.J. Simpson murder trial. O.J. Simpson accused of killing his wife, Nicole Simpson, and her friend, Ronald Goldman. Uh, it's a brutal murder. Um, O.J. Simpson was the primary sub-suspect. This picture designates the slow speed chase that took place throughout L.A. as we watched the white Bronco drive up and down the freeways with half of the L LAPD following him. It actually happened during the NBA playoffs and they had a split screen where they had the game going and they had the, the Bronco chase on the other screen. O.J. Simpson went on trial. The famous scene from the trial, we all watched it. It was covered 24-7 on court TV, a, a previous uh, cable channel we had. And this was O.J. Simpson trying to try on the bloody gloves that were found at the crime scene through, I guess, some great acting and drama. The gloves didn't fit. Johnny Cochran gave his famous closing argument that if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. And O.J. Simpson was acquitted of all charges. He is in jail today, though, for uh, charges stemming from a robbery that was, uh, that was conducted. So some people call that his comeuppance. Some people say not even close. So... A lot of new technology came out in the 90s. You guys are going to love this one. This is when the cell phone first came out. Before 1990, we didn't even know what a cell phone was. That was something James Bond had in his car, or the very rich. But you can see by the graph there, it's introduced in the 90s, but by the end of 2008, millions have cell phones. You guys, everybody has a cell phone today. So that is commonplace. In fact, today, cell phone technology is pretty much replaced landline technology in most, most homes. The web came out in 1990, or the internet. The www.whatever was first introduced in the 90. Before that, oh, believe it or not, we used books to do research. But now what would we do without the internet? You wouldn't be watching this without the internet, so thank you. Pop culture of the 90s, we had the grunge look come out. Beanie Babies were the big thing. Um, TV shows that were introduced, Friends came out in the 90s, The Simpsons, Seinfeld. We look at uh, movies, Titanic, Forrest Gump, Shawshank Rebellion, Save It Private Ryan. Private Ryan. Save It Private Ryan is a great movie if uh, you want to uh, watch uh, the, the D-Day Invasion. It's a great one to watch. Uh, Nirvana, that was uh, the, the big music. Uh, Metallica came out in the 90s. Alanis Morissette, great music in the 90s. This is going to lead us to the election of 2000. And honestly, guys, you could synthesize this back to 1992 and back to 1912. Except this time, instead of the Republicans being split, it's the Democrats. And it's not by much. Ralph Nader is going to pull votes from Al Gore. And just enough that it's going to give Bush the victory. However, there was a pause in this election. 
this election is really when we started slowing down projecting winners, I guess, if you will. Bush had been projected the winner of Florida, and that's going to be the state that gives him the Electoral College. Al Gore is going to call with his congratulations and his concessions. However, he's going to re repeal or, or pull back that concession when there's some questions about the ballots in Florida, specifically in Palm Beach, Florida. And there's going to be a big recount that's going to take place between the Bush camp and the Gore camp. And it's all going to come down to the ballots that were being used. The confusion at the Palm Beach polls, and not every county uses the same ballot. This is where uh, the idea of federalism, the division of powers between state and the federal government come into play. Um, the Palm Beach ballot, if you notice, you can see that Al Gore is listed second on the ballot. However, his, his, the punch hole where you, you vote for him is the third circle down. And so if you punch the second hole, meaning that you, you, know, you thought you were voting for the Democrat, the second name down, you were actually voting for the Reform Party and Pat Buchanan. And so a lot of people said, oh, I think I voted for the, sec the second hole and not the third, so I didn't vote right. So the recount has to take place. And so all the ballots are pulled. And these are paper ballots at the time, guys, and not the electronic ones that we have today. So what happens is we start analyzing these ballots. And every ballot is looked at. And that little piece of paper that's punched out when you put the little pin through the, the ballot is called a chad. And we try to determine what the chad told us about the voter. If it's a hanging chad, a swinging door chad, it basically you've got to give the intent of the voter to vote for that particular candidate. However, if we see a tri chad, a dimple chad, or what was known as a pregnant chad, what we might have to assume is that pre that person intended to vote for somebody else and then change their mind. So what we saw basically was these poor counters in Florida having to analyze the intent of every single ballot. The result was we got within 537 votes. It, the vote was certified. Bush as the winner. Gore was going to challenge this legally. It is going to go all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court gives Bush the victory and H.W. Bush becomes the 43rd president of the country. And now we're into the 21st century. And the 21st century basically is going to see the Bush years, a new Iraqi-Afghanistan war, and the election of our first African-American president. And that's going to um, basically end the 20th century for us. So thanks for watching, and you guys have a fantastic day.